I was having way too much fun making a thumbnail for this. God, poor camera. If you ever wonder why I don't have nice stuff, this is why. Just clean you guys off there, make it look pretty again. Geek crew, you looking fine. All joking aside, time to be serious. Does tap water, particularly tap water that contains chlorine or chloramide, actually harm your plants? I think the reason why this question is asked comes down to the fact that we often see such an explosion in growth after it rains or when we do use rainwater, we tend to see a healthier garden. Combined with the fact that we've had it drilled into our heads that things like synthetic fertilizers are inherently very harmful to soil microbes, which is a whole separate video that I'm gonna do. Okay. So here's a little bit of a story from when I was in university. I got my degree. I don't know if they wanted to give it to me, but after you spend so much money, they just kind of give it to you. I'm pretty sure that's what half the internet thinks anyways. Fat Frank, my secretary, and myself here uh, editing. I cut out a portion of the video only because I got a little bit ranty in it. I got super excited. We started talking about labs and it just all went downhill but what i will say is that ultimately i did do a lab where i chose to take a soil sample from directly where the poop shoot is essentially the water that has been heavily treated to get rid of all our human yuckiness before it gets put back into the saskatchewan river so theoretically if there was microbes that would be damaged or harmed in the soil but the results from that i'm going to put at the end of the video because that's kind of where it fits best i think some of you are going to be pretty shocked with the results of that soil sample i know i was personally shocked the hypothesis i had was totally opposite of the reality so when chlorine is mixed with water it causes hypochloric acid not hyperchloric acid hypochloric acid hypochloric acid is incredibly deadly to some but not all bacteria So that is why there's things like Berkeley water filters or reverse osmosis machines that actually remove that additional bacteria. Anyways, I digress. So the question is, well, how did those survive? Are they just inherently resistant to hypochloric acid or just chlorine in general, or is it something else? Well, turns out that the ones that survived the introduction of chlorine or chloramide into the water were ones that were kind of hanging out in the biofilm. So what's the biofilm? The biofilm is actually something similar to what we talked about in the video about soil microbes and kind of where they hang out and where they live. And that is kind of a space where microbes build their own brick house, if you will. So the best way that they, the, the way that they do this is they build their little army bunker by themselves through their waste. So when they go poopies, their poopies build their little home and the poopies help protect them. And poopies and I'll show me Anyways, uh, <laughs> that is what is protecting them in the water. Now soil, we know actually does have this biofilm uh, because we have microbes that are excreting waste. So there are microbes that can hang out in the biofilm that are protected. So does that mean that some microbes make it through the introduction of chlorine water, tap water? Yes, the answer is yes to that. So. What other ways do they survive the influx of artillery shells, AKA our water sprinklers? And that is CEC, AKA cation exchange capacity. Yes. So what that is, is something that soil science uses to determine the battery reserve, if you will, or the ability to be a battery reserve, if you will, of a certain soil. So sandy soils have a lower cation exchange capacity and clay soils have a higher cation exchange capacity. As a gardener, you want to land in the world of loam, meaning you could just kind of have a little bit of sand, silt, and clay. So kind of a mix if you watch this video here on how to amend the soil accordingly. Anyways, now that I'm trying to pitch you on watching the whole freaking channel, Geek crew, is it working? I don't know if it is, probably not. Half of them probably just clicked off at this point, so that's okay, it's just you and me now. So, so let's have a buffer. So what the buffer is, is it is the ability for the soil to have a charge that connects or pulls certain ions out of whatever's being applied in this case, tap water, rainwater, fertilizer even, you name it. 
organic or synthetic, by the way, both apply to this. So when it pulls it out, it holds it in and it essentially buffers it, if you will, and protects by diluting, in a way, the intensity of the chemical that's being added. Now, I'm not saying that chlorine is added in a, in, a, in a capacity that's super duper high. I'm not saying that at all for our tap water. Although sometimes you can smell it, which is a little odd, but I digress. Not saying that it's super duper high, but I'm just saying that it does buffer chemicals that are present, and one of which is chlorine that's already diluted in our tap water. So you can see why it actually plays a little bit of a factor in the world of protecting our soil microbes. It definitely plays a factor in just any sort of salt being added to our soil, the buffering capacity of the soil. Okay, so we know the biofilm within the water is a protective mechanism for the microbes present in water. We also know that the chitin exchange capacity and or the buffer of our soil acts as another protectant. Now, another way in which we can protect our microbes from chlorine is through exposure to air. So if you did not know, chlorine gases off and chlorine gases off when exposed to air. So if you actually leave water sitting out, your chlorine levels will decrease because it gases off. Kind of interesting is when you spray it, like how I was doing in the beginning of the video with the, t like with the nozzle, that actually decreases it just as effectively as having a bucket of water outside for 12 hours. Just fun fact, I don't know if any of you care about it, but it's kinda cool. And this is where I'm gonna ruin a lot of days, a lot of people's thought processes, if you will, because that's what I do as a redhead. I'm a soul eater, and if that involves challenging you in the world of plant and soil science, I'm here for it. What happened with the professor? Well, I brought the soil sample in. We did like a titration, dilution, all the different ratios or percentages of um, soil bacteria and intensity put into a different bunch of different petri dishes and we got bacteria and fungus and everything actually showed up just fine on the petri dish and it was similar to another person's garden soil and actually pretty similar to some agricultural land that had fertilizer and pesticides applied there was no statistical difference between my what i assumed was heavily treated water coming into the water treatment plant um, and just regular soil that other people boring people chose to get because i went for what i thought was cool i'm sorry can you uh, can you tell i'm holding a grudge against the saskatoon water plant for not killing everything. I thought I was going to be famous for that study. Anyways, I mentioned the decrease of chlorine through either letting it sit out or through spraying it. That's not statistically different. It's lower, yes, but it doesn't actually make a big difference. And that's because there isn't much chlorine in our water to begin with. So that doesn't make a difference. And the actual addition of chlorinated water tap water to your soil is not statistically significant in decreasing the, the microbes in your soil. Fungus, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, you name it, they're all fine. Now, why do our plants respond so much differently to rainwater versus our tap water? Well, that actually comes down to two different factors. I try to stress this so many different times when it comes to seedlings in particular, because I, this first one actually makes a massive difference, and that is the temperature. Tap water that comes out of the hose is cold, and plants aren't like humans. When it's plus 30 out, they don't appreciate a cool down period. What they do appreciate is a gradual potential cool down period and or something that is ambiently the same as what they're already sitting in. That is the factor number one is the actual temperature. Now the second reason actually comes down to the fact that rainwater inherently is a fertilizer. So what I mean by that is there is in particular nitrogen and in particular nitrate present in our rainwater. And that's just because that's what rainwater is made out of. And tap water doesn't necessarily have it in concentrations that make a difference. So when we water with rainwater, we have temperature, we have an influx of literally the macronutrient that causes growth. It has nothing to do with the chlorine or the chloramine present in the rainwater. So 
Doesn't matter if you water with tap water. Now, could you make tap water more effective by putting it in a bucket and letting it warm up over the day and then hand watering your entire garden? Yes. Is it worth your time? I don't know. You guys can gauge that. If you really like gardening and you want to take the time to hang out with your plants and talk to them like I do, then yes, it's worth your time. If you're lazy and you're just like, give me the goods, give me the goods, mother nature, see you later. And just water with your sprinklers. This doesn't really make a difference. Starting hair tick out. If you want to learn whether or not synthetic fertilizers kill your soil microbes, this video here. If you want to know what Google thinks you're thinking, this video right here. Peace.